Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this masterclass brought to you by Mortgage Solutions in association with OSB Group. As you may know, OSB Group's main lending brands are Precise Mortgages, Kent Reliance for Intermediaries and Interbay, among other brands, and they're a leading specialist buy-to-let lender. I'm Paula John, I'm your chair for this session, and I'm delighted to be joined today by our expert speakers. They are John Hall, who's Group Managing Director of Mortgages and Savings at OSB Group. Hi, John. Yeah, hi, Paula, and good morning, everybody, and I hope everybody's staying warm this morning. And we're also joined by Neil Chambers of Mortgage Consultants Serious Property Finance. He's going to be sharing his perspectives, not just as a mortgage broker, but also as a landlord of 20 years standing. Good morning to you, Neil. Morning, Paula. Morning, John. Thanks for having me on. Lovely to be here with everyone. Now, the private rental sector plays a crucial role in the housing landscape of the UK, providing homes for around 20% of all households, many of which are, of course, financed by a buy-to-let mortgage. Buy-to-let landlords, the profile of them has changed a lot in the last decade, especially since 2015, of course, since various political, economic and legislative changes have brought lots of pressure to bear on the sector. We've seen a major change in the way buy-to-let income is treated for tax purposes, of course, and that's prompted a huge rise in limited company buy to let and there are other significant changes happening in this market including growing professionalization and greater engagement with energy efficiency now if we could have our first slide please um we have uh, pulled together some recent headlines on this slide you may well have seen some of them so i won't read them all out but they do point to some of the themes we're going to look at there are a couple of stories there about the benefits of retrofitting and upgrading some larger portfolios. It's quite a range of stories here, actually. Another one is about the fact that house prices are falling, but with the higher cost of borrowing, first time buyers still can't afford to buy. And that, of course, is feeding into more demand from for, uh, for rental properties from tenants. Uh, the mortgage solutions story there describes buy to let affordability recovering in January. And there's a story out this morning about the number of products out there, which is now 2,400 back to the levels it was at last uh, July, though obviously costs are still higher than, than they have been. So that's a challenge for landlords, but a potential opportunity for brokers. Um, and finally, in there, there's a Daily Express story saying the pendulum swung too far. It's time to stop demonising landlords who are playing a key role in providing housing for so many people. So we're going to pick out some of these things and we'll look at the implications of the changes in the market for landlords and tenants. We'll look at the challenges they pose and the opportunities that greater professionalisation and energy awareness mean for you, the mortgage brokers operating in buy to let and where lenders need to be focusing their support. So in a nutshell, that's sort of what we'll cover. If you have any questions today, um, as you'll see on the left hand side of your screen, you've got there's a little thing where it says ask a question. If you click on there, you get a drop box. Type your question in there and we will come to those towards the end of the session and cover off as many as we can. Now, very shortly, I'm going to stop talking and I will hand over to John. I'm going to ask him to talk us through the results of an in-depth piece of research which OSB Group carried out in the latter half of 2022. As a forward-looking buy-to-let lender, OSB Group was very keen to find out how the buy-to-let sector is evolving and what landlords are really thinking about and planning for the future. So to that end, they interviewed a thousand landlords, 700 of them were professional landlords. So for the purposes of this research, professional was uh, uh, defined as people with four or more properties who derive most of their income from their, por their property portfolio. They also interviewed 300 part-time landlords who have other main sources of income and fewer than four properties. And they also spoke to 200 brokers. Um, the results were very interesting. Some were surprising, some were surprisingly positive. And there were some very interesting disconnects between what landlords said they were thinking and planning and what brokers thought their landlord clients were thinking and planning. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to John, who will take us through some of that material and we'll then discuss what it means for the markets, for landlords and for advisors. Over to you, John. Thank you, Paula. And if we move the next slide forward, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, so firstly, I'm going to cover uh, the key research findings in a little bit more detail than, than, than Paula has just done. And then uh, what we'll do is we'll dive into how this might inform our future strategies for the private rented sector, both as landlords, uh, lenders and as, as brokers as well. So um, in the second half of 2022, as, as Paula said, we uh, recognising our role at OSB as a provider of uh, financing homes, we set out to understand the changing shape of the private rented sector, but we did it through an ESG lens. Um, this was to shape our strategy, to understand how we might support our broker partners, um, and then to understand by listening how we might deliver 
the support that landlord clients needed today, but also looking forwards, um, what support they may well need as part of a, a sustainable sector for the long term. Um, we recognised, as everybody did, you saw the headlines that being a landlord today is not easy. Um, the rising cost of living, uh, there's new environmental legislation, an upward lift in interest rates and increasing regulations meant that obviously the, the, the sector is is often um, been talked about as, as challenged. Um, but from our perspective, it was important to kind of listen to what was happening on the ground. And as, as Paula said, we actually, um, through first of all, some, some in-depth um, kind of conversations with landlords and then, and then a, a polling of a thousand landlords, um, picked up that amongst all of that kind of change and turbulence, um, there was a new story being written um, and it was a much more positive story in lots of ways. Um, there was the emergence of uh, a new type of professional uh, landlord. Um, yes, it was a landlord that, that was focused on returns, but actually they had a passion for the industry that they operated within. They were very clearly running a business. Um, and most kind of relevantly, I guess, they were also focused on the opportunity to improve the, the lives of the tenants that they, they housed. Um, so really what we were seeing was um, an acceleration of the prof professionalization of the private rented sector, a, a trend that certainly started since 2016 in earnest. Um, it was an industry-wide recognition of the benefits that professionalization would bring. Um, and there was an emerging divergence between what motivated the professionals compared to what motivated part-time landlords. Um, and you can see that kind of come through here that said, if you look at the, the, the graphs on the left-hand side in terms of change makers in action, the landlord leaders, as we term them, are, were embracing three major drivers, um, environmental action, societal impact, um, and entrepreneurialism for growth. Um, you can see there that 80% of professional landlords had or have plans to increase portfolio size. Alongside that, um, there was also a, a key activity around rationalizing. And rationalizing is a very positive activity. It's very much looking at what's within the portfolio that needs to be improved upon. Um, sometimes there is sale within there, uh, and it is very much a very clear focus on, on what's going to be sustainable. Um, and the other part of it is 40% have actually invested in environmental upgrades. And you can see that differential compared to the part-time landlords very, very clearly. So um, there was a rationalization and investment coming through. Um, environmental improvement was coming through, and there very clearly was a new focus on um, tenant-focused solutions. So again, if you look at the um, the emphasis on the right-hand side in terms of the business of property and doing, doing good, uh, again, you can see uh, a much different spread around uh, just being in a, in a property for creating wealth or, or growing company. There was a, a very clear uh, link there towards a positive impact on tenants. So, so from our perspective, the so what of, of what we were looking at was probably to emphasize, I'd emphasize three things at the moment. One is um, professional landlords are committed to growth despite the negative headlines. Um, this is a group that are committed to their role in providing good quality homes across the UK. Um, secondly, they are thinking sustainably through a cycle um, and, uh, and, and they are thinking about investing ahead of the environmental kind of legislation. They, they see it as a good thing for their property. Um, and thirdly, they have commercial motivations, but they're also thinking of tenants as their customers and they're realizing the benefit of offering an attractive tenant lived experience. And, and they are very clearly recognizing this concept of, of a green premium in terms of value of a property um, and also on the rental yield that can be could be determined. And, and there's some very cl clear um, statistical evidence that says that, um, that, that investing in a property both gives a, an uplift in value um, and also makes obviously a property much more attractive from a rental yield perspective. So, so that's what the three things were coming forward there. Um, if we just move on to the next slide, please. Um, a landlord's perspective is very, very clear. They, they are seeing the benefits of, of a professionalization in the sector. Um, they're seeing it as a positive thing in terms of improving the lives of their tenants. Um, they are seeing it as a positive thing in terms of improving the sector's reputation, which is a third. Um, and actually they're seeing a very positive thing in terms of um, improving the life of the tenants, um, improving reputation and actually upgrading the perception that um, that the market has around around the private rented sector um, as a key activity and, and a key support towards providing material homes across the UK uh, from that perspective. And, and these are shifts that are materially underway as well. So 
Um, obviously, 71% of landlords say they have or will spend more time thinking about the tenancy experience is, is a really kind of very powerful piece because fundamentally they recognize happy tenants equals a more commercially viable business and, and a property as well. So um, those are the, the key kind of research findings, Paula, just to touch on those. And obviously, we'll dive into it in more detail. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, John. Um, could I come to Neil, just listening to all of that? Does that move to professionalization and to more consumer focused, if you like, tenant focused, bigger landlords? Does that chime with your experience, Neil, and what you've been seeing in recent years? Yeah, I think certainly over the last sort of five or six years, you know, once we see the tax changes come in uh, towards personal buy to let, there's certainly been a shift towards uh, limited company lending. And more so for, for landlords going into it in a little bit more of a professional manner. Um, so, yeah, certainly over the last five or six years, I've sort of seen that growth. And more, more so, the more, more clients that I tend to deal with are in that sector. Um, you know, I think the, the, the sort of part-time landlords, I think, did fall away a little bit. Um, so, yeah, for, certainly from that perspective, I agree with the findings. That, and in terms uh, of the concern with more concern with sustainability, I mean, this does show far more of a willingness on landlords' behalf to engage with the whole sustainability piece, doesn't it? From from what we're seeing, yeah. those, which sort of explodes with the reluctant landlord who doesn't really want to bother with energy. I think, I think you, as you said, you, you, one of your first opening statements was, um, you know, it's a big growing sector. You know, one in five households are, are rented properties. So. I think it's quite clear that you know it, it is becoming uh, bigger and bigger. Um, obviously, the events of the last sort of six months will have a little bit of an effect, as uh, as we're all seeing uh, over these last few months. But I think it's a sector that's here to stay and grow for sure. And um, and John, just looking at the key figures that have come out of this, particularly looking at the sustainability piece, how is that impacting your plan, your strategy as a lender at this stage? Um, I, I think when you when you're looking at it in a in a bit more detail, I think there's there's probably um, three areas to focus in on. Uh, I guess Paula, the, the first one is um, is to think about professional landlords are thinking entrepreneurially, um, and so what they're thinking about is actually a broader range of property types that they are seeing would support their longer term strategies. So they're recognising how tenants uh, want to live in a in a modern modern rental property, um, and potentially they're they're seeing that investment there. And an offering a wider range of property type is a win-win. So, for instance, what we're seeing is a strong demand for uh, adapted HMOs. Uh, so, six bedroom but six bathroom, um, re recognizing the, the the way in which uh, people want to live in some of those properties or student accommodation. So, so I think looking at those widening property types clearly, obviously, uh, determines a little bit about where you're you're investing your your lending activities. Um, I think the second element really is. And we, we touch on this a little bit later on is that um, actually financing improvements from net new borrowing were shown at only 12 percent of cases so so what this said was that this isn't necessarily a um you know th this kind of shift to an, a more environmentally friendly housing stock isn't going to be fixed by a single product um you know with a green label nor by kind of one-off um, property improvements the solutions really are, are more holistic looking across industry um looking at the whole of the, the portfolio of a landlord um, as well, and, and actually thinking about the experience of the tenant and, uh, and, and that environmental piece as well. So, so that journey to professionalism is about long-term thinking. Um, why, you know, why are people renting? Who is renting? And how are we going to continue to provide you know, sustainable, good quality housing through that period and develop an industry which not just has successful landlords, but also has kind of happy tenants uh, underpinning it as well. Um, I think and think fundamentally, um, as, as Neil said, th this demonstrated that landlords are thinking of growth. Um, so, you know, 76 um, percent of them have planned or will become limited companies. 72 percent are employing advisors and consultants to support them. Um, you know, 80 percent of professional landlords say they're increasing. So so the, you know, fundamentally what it says is this is a this is a sector um, both in terms of landlords, in terms of intermediaries operating within that sector, that we are focused very heavily in on. So, so from that perspective, those are kind of three areas that I think I'd just draw out in terms of how it's influencing our thinking. And so, Neil, where do the opportunities lie there, lie for brokers? Because it sounds like there's a lot of growth and activity in this centre, in this area, and at the professional end of the market, and mm. a lot of need for advice, presumably. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's what, that's exactly where the opportunities lie. I think it's uh, over these last five years, as the as the market has become a lot more professional, 
it, it has, you know, landlords have evolved into that space where they 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 are becoming a lot bigger um, and they're growing. And I, I think from a from a broker's point of view, there's there's opportunities because with that comes the need for specialist advice because I think the buy to let sector in general has moved a lot more into the specialist space. You know, um, without naming lenders, um, you, you know, go back sort of 10, 15 years, there was a, certainly a different group of lenders than what there are now today. So it's quite evident that uh, the market has become a lot more specialist. And I think that's where the opportunities lie for brokers to sort of jump in, learn, educate yourself uh, in terms of what lenders are out there and what they do, because there, there's a whole mixture uh, of lenders that, um, that that are in that space. And I think that's where landlords need that that advice to be able to grow. You mentioned um, the huge shift to limited company by select, which we've seen, I think it's in the region of 300,000 in, in a mm. couple of years. Um, landlords obviously are looking to streamline and restructure to maximise their, their profits. They're going to want to mm. do that even more in economically challenging times that we've got at the moment. Um, so is there support in place for landlords to do that? Um, is there support for brokers? I mean, obviously, brokers are not meant to advise on tax, are they? Which is the key consideration when it comes to incorporation. So yeah, would you absolutely. Some more help um, and support in those areas. Yeah, I mean, look, as a broker, we're we're not able to give the tax advice to a client. Um, we always advise them to go and seek tax advice, and it is it's a specialist area because I honestly don't think that the you know your average accountant, without being uh, demeaning are actually that well versed in what what the process is and and what needs to be done but certainly seeing the the the, the want from landlords to to sort of move into that sector i think if you look back at sort of your older style landlords that have been around 20 years some of them have still got personal name portfolios which do need do need the correct tax advice to move into that space into the limited company space but certainly new new clients coming or or, or expanding their portfolios it seems to be down the limited company route which obviously needs a lot more specialist advice. And John, is there a role for lenders to help in that process at all? I mean, obviously, it helps that you you actually work. You will offer mortgages in in that sector. Some of the uh, lenders out there won't deal with limited company. Um, you do, but uh, how, that whole relationship between the, the tax advisor and the broker and, and the the uh, and the yeah, client. I think um, I mean it, Neil, Neil makes a very good point. I mean, it's it's about I think we compared notes. I think it's about seventy percent of what we see come through is is in that limited company structure over the over the past kind of uh, number of years um, on both sides. And I think um, certainly. Um, there are there are certainly experts and specialists around to to kind of provide that advice. Um, what what one of the things that that I mean, we'll touch on some of the, the responses that we're making from a, an OSB perspective is we we work very closely with, um, with with intermediaries with existing landlords in terms of going on that journey. Sometimes they can be quite complicated with you know up to maybe even 100 properties involved. That takes that takes a number of um, steps to to go through that incorporation. Um, there's a good, case, good good couple of case studies in the research of of advice advisors who have worked with landlords and with us to go on that journey and, and take that tax advice. Um, so certainly there are um, specialist intermediaries who, who have a well trodden in that practice of incorporation and then and then management with a, a client that is incorporated. Um, from, from our perspective, we've worked over a, a number of years with EY as a specialist tax uh, advisor in producing our own tax guides within Kent Reliance. Um, and we're looking one of the, the kind of Within the package of measures that we've launched, one of the areas there is to is to try step up the way in which we can access some of that support for for um, for landlords and for intermediaries because we think it's important actually that this professionalisation is actually a route that even current part time landlords can go down um, with their with their advisors as well. So we're looking to to, to facilitate better uh, linkage between advisors. Um, but my my recommendation on this is there are there is strong support within the specialist intermediary f space to actually um, navigate this pathway. So there is always somebody around that that has gone through the steps that are required and that can facilitate this. And, and certainly, incorporation should not be a barrier to um, to kind of a landlord going on that that journey of professionalisation. Excellent. And just to, to look at one other aspect that came up in the, these two slides, and one was um, when asking for landlords motivations obviously uh, it doesn't matter if you're professional or part-time the primary motivation on the last slide I think said uh, that it, it's about earning potential obviously but 29 of professionals cited having a positive impact on their tenants lives and as this slide we've got up now shows they want to improve tenants lives drive poorer landlords out of the sector and improve landlords reputation so if we could just have a quick chat about that before we move on um I think it's great why does this awful 
demon Ruckman sort of reputation for landlords come from, do you think? They do get a, a bad rap. So, Neil, why do you think that is? Oh, I, I think that probably dates back many, many years ago. Um, as you say, you look at the numbers now, one in five households, I think it's far greater than what it was 20 years ago. You know, being a landlord back at the, the you know, the end of uh, the 90s was probably a, you know, a, a smaller, a lot smaller proportion. But uh, I think the, rep, the the reputation just probably is quite old and out of date. Um, I think a lot more people are in the sector now. And uh, as you say, it's become a lot more professional, a lot more talked about. Um, you know, I don't think there's a dinner party you'll go to that, you know, you'll speak to someone that hasn't got another property. Um, so, yeah, it's just a growing sector. But I'd like to think that reputation goes because being a landlord myself, I'd, I'd always sort of deem myself sort of proactive of, of upgrading a property or, or correcting a repair and, and keep the maintenance going of a property because ultimately it comes back to that first point, improving the lives of tenants and just you keep, you keep the tenant happy, they'll stay in the property and that then alleviates the voids, which is the, probably one of the biggest things uh, that you want to you want to avoid. Absolutely. If we could come on to the next slide now, please. Um, and this is just quite an interesting one in terms of uh, the momentum change. And it's about perception. So we've got 91% of landlords feel there are benefits to this professionalisation of the sector we've been talking about. 73% of brokers agree the sector is professionalising, but only 30% think that that's a good thing. Um, Neil, why do you think that disconnect is there? And what can it tell us? I don't know. It does surprise me. I'd only envisage that if you're a broker sat there thinking that it's not a change for the good, it's sometimes we don't always like change, do we? Having to move with the times and sort of move with the different changes in how you can, you know, uh, transact your business. So I, I don't, I, yeah, I, I don't, uh, I, I'm certainly in the camp that think it's a good thing. I think it's going to create opportunities within the broker sector because, um, you know, you know, by by a landlord needing to navigate sort of you know different changes and and what's ahead, uh, they need more specialist advice. So, I, I think it's a good thing. You know, at the end of the day, if, if more landlords and clients reach out to you because they need help in arranging finance, then you know it can only be a good thing for the broker sector. I really do. John, John, would you have any theories on that disconnect? I, I think as as we were surprised by it, um, I think. I think what was what was probably behind it was was landlords have been on this journey for um, particularly for you know, in, environmental investment management of their portfolios, thinking longer term. Um, that they are they are much more advanced in their thinking around managing their businesses than than probably you know to a degree we we might have anticipated. Um, that they they were the landlord leaders. They they were ahead of the curve. And I think sometimes there's a there's a kind of information asymmetry um, in terms of brokers being in a in a position that you know intermediaries are, are there to advise. Um, and sometimes when a when a client is pretty well informed, maybe that's a, a barrier to to getting into that. And I think um, it's certainly one that I think is disappearing. I think that there is a, a huge amount of of specialist expertise within the intermediary sector around working with landlords in that position. I actually think it's a very positive thing. The more that landlords are thinking longer term, the more they're growing and developing, actually their, their portfolio needs, their financing needs in the round become more complex um, and, and they need more access to, to support and they're, they're recognising that. So it was a bit of a surprise, but I think it more reflects how advanced landlords are in terms of their thinking at the moment, which is again, a, a very positive thing in terms of um, recognizing that, you know, there's there's about, I think it's last time I saw it, 44% um, drop in availability of, of, of rental properties compared to 2019. There's a huge demand here um, and, and, a, and a massive role. And um, I think you know, for, from that perspective, if it's about helping brokers go on that professionalizing journey on occasions, then then we can we can do that certainly. And and as Neil said, that there's plenty of specialist intermediaries that can help on that journey where um, where maybe buy to let is a is a lesser part of the um, of an advisor's portfolio. Yeah, maybe the, some brokers don't realize quite how big the opportunity is and might need mm -hmm. some some help to take advantage of that. Excellent. So can we move on to the next slide, please? This one. Um, this report looks quite closely at what's happening to the market in light of potential changes to EPC regulation. We've touched on this, but let's just dig into it a little bit more. 68% said that they had or were planning to invest in upgrades. 
Now, that is a surprisingly high number. As we said, it explodes that myth that buy-to-let landlords don't want to engage with this stuff. Um, I'd just like to ask Neil, as a landlord as well as a broker, did this figure surprise you? No, not really. Um, I, I, I think for me, it just almost comes natural that at the end of the day, you're sometimes forced to make um, changes and upgrades, um, you know, in terms of your properties to ensure that they sort of, you, you know, maybe new boilers or, or, or changes to sort of uh, in, insulations or, or just general sort of upgrades and repairs. But uh, no, it doesn't, so the, the 68%, I would have thought potentially it'd be a bit more, but, um, you know, I think it's probably around a fair figure. There speaks a landlord leader. <laughs> it is a very high figure. John, what was your response to that from a lending perspective? Yeah, I think, um, again, it, it, it's very positive. I think I think it's the, the three initials there of EPC that tend to be the one that kind of polarise opinion. Um, I, I think what we're, what we're definitely seeing is, picks up on what Neil said, is it's not necessarily done... Um, purely with an EPC a scoring mind, it's actually done because it's about maintaining the fabric of a of a solid property. Um, you know, we we would all live in in properties and want to. You know, we need to change boilers. We need to do. You know, have experience mm. with change the roof, some of the fabric of it, um, and and make sure it's fit for purpose. It's not it's not depreciating. It's actually appreciating as an asset. So, um, I think I think that by its very nature means that they are they are or they are planning to invest because that's part of maintaining their assets. Um, I think EPCs are the one that um, are probably the the kind of, it's a bit, as I said, a bit more polarizing. Um, and, and I think the other surprise of it is that legislation hasn't yet been confirmed as to timing. I think all of the, the direction is around 2025, but that hasn't yet been committed to from a date perspective, so it may well change. But that doesn't mean that landlords don't think that they should be investing. They they are taking action to upgrade because again they're seeing it more holistically in terms of the property uh, classification and, and the tenant opportunity is there, um, and it's less about a focus on a deadline and a particular EPC grading. It's more about making sure that the asset is fit for purpose and and continues to appreciate rather than depreciate. So doing the right thing rather than just ticking boxes. If we could just touch on the EPC thing, though, because you are right. I mean, there was a Times article last week that the headline was why misleading EPC ratings are a national scandal. Um, what is your view of EPC ratings? Are they a national scandal or are they the best sort of measurement we've got? Um, I think from from our perspective, I mean, EPCs are the benchmark that's available. Um, I think it, it was an interesting article in the Times, and I think there probably is a um, an acceptance that says that they are there is a degree of inaccuracy around them. Um, and looking on the positive side, there are probably more properties that are a C than a D, and more properties that are a B than a C. Um, yeah, as a as a cost, they're a relatively small cost in terms of over appraising an overall property. So they're they're definitely um, open to to kind of um, inaccuracy in terms of their information. But they are they are the, the benchmark that we have available. Um, I, I do think that having good, solid decision making gives the landlord the confidence. Unfortunately, I think EPCs are a bit challenged in that space. But, you know, our, our job of work is to look at how do we look at alternatives to provide the right environmental information on a property, on how a tenant lives in that property, how it's connected to the grid to understand what improvements can get made. Um, so so for me, you know, they, they are what we have. We need to work on improving them and look at other sources of information that would give a landlord um, a, 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 a more assessment of what is needed um, and what needs to get spent at what at what point in time um, to to improve on a property. So, I think they're flawed. Um, you know, we're we're working on different ways to enhance environmental data because it is going to be key to good decision making. Thanks, John. John, just the other stat that we have also touched on but we should come back to on this slide obviously is that only 12 percent of those landlords said that they were going to finance these upgrades through net new borrowing um we don't have all the other figures in front of us here but i think a lot of it the plans to come out of capital reserves do you think given the economically challenging situation we're in that's likely to change with landlords being less or less willing to use up their capital reserves and maybe forced or, or unable to use up the capital reserves forced down the borrowing route or just choose the borrowing route in order to uh, to not give up all of their capital? Do you th are you seeing anything like that, Neil? Yeah, I'm sorry, Neil. <laughs> oh, good. No, I, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really see landlords 
refinancing properties for small amounts of money to, to sort of do, you know, energy efficient upgrades. I think it would just come from, as you say, cash flows or, or potentially a, a major refinance that would maybe fully refurbish a property as opposed to just maybe doing an odd boiler uh, change or, uh, you know, change of windows, et cetera. Um, I, that, I, I think that's probably why the, the stat at 12% is probably, it, it, that, that's the reason it is low. I, I've not seen or had any requirements from a landlord wanting to, you know, borrow a small amount of money just to do um, upgrades um, for energy efficiency. I think it'd be a bigger scale. Sure. John, are you expecting to see more of that activity then? Yeah, I, I think um, it's no. It, there's no one size fits all. Um, I, I don't think that this will change, as Neil says. I don't think that um, financing for a small amount um, is likely to be the way. I think I think what you, you're seeing is more of a remortgage and refinance of the whole, having done the work potentially out of uh, out maintenance budgets or out of cash reserves, um, or, or kind of you know a lot of landlords are actually got unencumbered properties. Well, what what this will probably mean is that they will will take a view to encumber some of those properties to free up the cash across the portfolio. So again, the the kind of the message when when we're thinking about intermediaries growth strategies in this space is to is to get that holistic view, to look at that portfolio overall and to see how there's opportunities across it rather than look at it as, as a binary um, perspective in terms of one property. And, and and certainly, you know, when we're underwriting, um, you know, we're, we're using portfolio information to, to make an overall uh, informed lending decision. And I think you know, when, when intermediaries are thinking about their own growth strategies, think about how you can get that holistic view um, and look at opportunities. And it, it's it's quite, um, I think that's quite gratifying when you can do that because you might spot opportunities that, that actually the landlord hasn't seen for themselves. And obviously there are more opportunities for that with 75% of them saying they're rationalising. These are the conversations that you're having when, with your broker when you want it to rationalise. Great, can we move on to the next slide, please? So this is about broker perspectives. Now, uh, brokers recognise the challenges faced by landlords. The word challenge has cropped up quite a lot this morning, but as has its corollary, opportunity, where you have one, you have the other. So this um, shows that the results when brokers were asked to identify landlord challenges, you've got managing increased legislation, making a return on investment, tenant affordability and complying with environmental regulations being the four front runners. Those percentages presumably will move up and down a little bit. The affordability thing might be biting a bit more now, for example, but they're likely to remain the four dominant concerns. Look at this slide. Where are the opportunities for brokers to help their landlord clients with this and for lenders to support? So Neil, looking, thinking about the um, broker opportunities first. I think certainly at the moment, over the last six months, has been the uh, change in, um, um, you know, the way the pricing and the market has gone in general. That's probably the biggest challenge at the moment facing landlords is to how to restructure portfolios to sort of try and keep affordable uh, because of the increase in uh, in pricing. Um, so that that's probably the biggest challenge at the moment um, facing landlords. And um, so from a broker's uh, perspective. It's how you navigate those landlords through, you know, is it, you know, looking at keeping debt with existing lenders and trying to uh, maybe gain product transfer and beneficial rates or, or trying to refinance uh, and getting the right deal. I mean, there's without trying to detract from the energy side of things, um, the pricing is the big, uh, a big topic at the moment and, and what way landlords turn, you know, do they refinance into a fixed rate? You know, is there expectation that rates might sort of slope off a little bit towards the end of the year? That's that's the challenge I can see at the moment. Um, no crystal balls available, unfortunately. Um, John, what, where can lenders support in any of the, these challenges? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, we've been very focused over the last six months as well on, on maintaining a consistency of, of interest rate pricing. Um, you know, making sure that that we're we're kind of understanding where where those kind of price points are. Um, also working, you know, so we, we have a very strong retention and approach with our, our intermediaries as well. So we have a high net worth team that works with um, specialist intermediaries to look at how portfolio reconstruction or, or portfolio rationalization can take place or how we can actually support maybe on incorporation as part or walk that journey hand in hand with an intermediary and a, and, and a client in terms of incorporation. Because again, you've got potentially advantages on, on incorporation versus personal name, um, property ownership as well. So I think that that's key. Um, I do think also some of these things go together that says, 
complying with new environmental and making a decent return on investment can work together. So, you know, again, I referenced the kind of green premium and a rental yield. Well, actually, let's look at how we can we can operate there. So, you know, we've we've got a refurb buy to let product which combines a short term finance with the security of a long term buy to let exit, which means that you can, again, support on that kind of that transition of a property. And potentially what you're looking at there is um, an enhanced property value. Uh, that you can gear against um, with a rental yield that is positive to the uh, interest coverage side as well. So, so all of these, I think, all of these elements. That, 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 so, what of it is they're all interlinked, um, and uh, you know, and, and I think you know, affordability and return are going to be um, you know key kind of uh, key thought processes. Um, and not not have not overspending on environmental is is also important. Whilst we haven't got some of those regulations coming through yet there. Um, and uh, but I do think again tenant affordability and legislation that potentially just improves the quality of the housing stock and and the and the support for tenants is actually a positive thing in the long run as well. It, it continues to give a strong support to to the tenant demand for for rental properties, which I think is a very positive thing as well. So so we're trying to see the connectivity of all of these things, Paul. You know we're seeing them. You know we'll we'll touch on it next, but you know we're trying to see the product enhancements, the way in which we can manage some of our processes and our service to support alongside it as well um and then make sure that we're we're kind of you know we're, we're walking on the journey with uh, intermediaries and landlords as well in, at that point can i take ask you to move on to the next slide and take us through some of that that uh, the journey yeah so um so yeah so i think um you know from our perspective what we didn't want to do is we didn't want to just um land some research without actually kind of putting uh, a response behind it um, we also felt that it was better to promise a direction on some things um, rather than wait until everything was fully formed. So, so we launched a, a kind of package of measures which came at, at um, the research from a number of different angles. Um, we, we thought about it in terms of how we can support lending. Um, we thought about products that go alongside that. Um, we also thought about processes and partnerships. Um, and and actually developed a series of, of measures along those lines. So, if I firstly focus on the on the product side, I've referenced the reefer buy to let, which is a, a good example of um, product innovation to support energy enhancement. So there are some steps that there, which basically mean that um, if you've upgraded your property or you and you're going through the process, we reward you for the for the activity of going through that transition rather than just give you a, a green label of or we'll give you a better rate if you're already done it or an ABC. So we actually facilitate that change at that that property investment um, we've put put aside uh, an amount of lending for our existing borrowers in 2023 um, which will again be either subsidized rates or accommodating lo loan to values or, or interest coverage ratios to support that refurbishment so we can help with the void um, so we're just in the process of working through what what that would mean and what is useful because actually just subsidized rates aren't necessarily um, just what people are looking to do given what we, we mentioned earlier um, I referenced um, the, the the area that we're looking at markets that we can lend into more, um, such as student accommodation, semi-commercial, and adapted HMOs. So again, thinking about how landlords are, are building and diversifying their portfolios and making sure that our lending processes, our underwriting uh, expertise keeps pace with that. Um, so we're we're investing in in that side of our business, and and the third element really is about facilitating community and partnerships. Um, so, so what that might mean is, as I've said, extend our relationship with EY from a tax specialist perspective about supporting landlords and intermediaries that look to go through that process on incorporation. Um, we're running a pilot scheme. You know, we touched on EPCs. We're running a pilot scheme with an energy improvement uh, provider called Ciro, um, who do a very detailed survey costing close to £500 around the property and, and the lived experience. And then they identify a stepped program of enhancement relative to the improvement in in basically the cost of running that property and the premium for um, the value of that property. Well, we're, we're funding that £500 for a number of our existing landlords to sort of say, let's look at how that experience works. And if it if that pilot works really well, we'd look to, to roll that out as well. Um, we're looking at a project involving 50 properties, which may well need um, energy efficiency um, measures such as retrofitting. So we're looking to fund that and, and see where that learning comes from. Um, and then we've we kind of, the last point on there is about, um, we framed this as the landlord leaders community. So so we think we want to try and play, create a place where landlords can talk to intermediaries and lenders and each other, 
brokers and industry leaders can come together. And actually, it's a bit of a hub that means that we can share uh, the issue, big issues that are being faced. Um, look at some of the the methods that have have been successful in solving for some of those, um, and then hopefully see that network kind of um, grow successful stories and case studies, which which can be replicated. Because generally, you know, from from a landlord's perspective, they're not not in competition that necessarily with each other and um, and actually it's about sharing experiences and you can see from the research itself that they're only too keen to do so because they recognize that if we make the sector more sustainable um, we grow that experience and, and we, we create kind of happy tenants then in effect the private rent the rental sector becomes you know kind of more sustainable for the future as well so you'll be hearing more we will certainly be publishing more about how that community is coming together over the coming months as well there lots of exciting stuff going on there. Neil, from a broker's perspective, which of the many elements in there excites you the most? Um, well, always welcome new product ranges, um, something to get your teeth into, um, especially if it's something innovative and uh, can, can create some opportunity. Um, and probably the last one, really, um, just in regards to the, you know, the landlord leaders community, you know, if it, if it enables us to sort of integrate and, and liaise with landlords and just to learn different things about what's happening in the industry, it can only help your your education as to grow as a broker uh, and hopefully bring in more business for yourself. Excellent. Hopefully that's sort of a rallying cry for the industry to look to the future and for all of us to get behind the evolving vital sector. Um, I'm going to come now, if I may, to, oh, in fact, no, just before we come to a few questions from the audience, can I ask you briefly to sum up your your vision of the future of the buy-to-let market in the UK and how we can collectively drive progress together? Maybe we could come on to the next slide and just succinctly, first of all, Neil, if you could tell me what your vision of the buy-to-let sector is. Oh, big question. Um, I think look, I think it's clear that it's a growing industry. I think there's going to be a few bumpy uh, bumps in the road as we go along um, in terms of uh, pricing at the moment. Um, people trying to restructure portfolios. I think you, uh, John touched on in that last slide around the tax advice. I think that could still be a, a continuing big, big topic for a lot of landlords wanting to sort of um, incorporate their portfolios. Um, and again, with that is going to create opportunity for brokers. So I think going forward, I think it's clear that, you know, it's going to, the, the sector is going to continue to grow. But like anything, you're going to have bumps along the road um, in terms of business levels up and down. Uh, but I think it's clear that the buy to let sector is here to stay. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope, only hope that is the case. I think it's a, you know, a rewarding sector of, of uh, the mortgage industry. Thank you, Neil. And same question to John, please. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, certainly we, we, we kind of position this as a intermediaries thinking about their own growth strategies. I think having access to that specialist community of partnerships to complement their own expertise is, is definitely one. Um, understanding that there is products and processes with lenders with appetite and expertise in specialist property is a second one. So work out with either themselves or with, with other specialist advisors where they, those lenders would be. Clearly, OSB has got that range of lending. Um, and I think as just to to reiterate what Neil said, that the private rental sector has been very core to lending growth since the turn of the century. And, and you know, what we're seeing through this report um, and our own findings is that it will continue to do so. There may well be reinvention. There may well be, there is continued professionalization, but it's here to stay. And it's, it's a fundamental part of providing um, growth opportunities, lending strength um, and, and, a, and a good societal impact in terms of, um, you know, good property for people to live in. Thank you very much indeed. That's great. Now, we've just got time for a few questions from the audience. First off, hello, everyone. Thanks for the session today. What advice could you give a broker that's trying to specialise in this sector of the market without a client bank? Uh, Neil, I guess that might be one of you. Um, I think it's always tough to just create a client bank, you know, within a, a, a short space of time. It, it does take time to do so. And, and just by educating yourself, really, you know, so you're up to speed, so you're able to talk to clients because... You know, you're, you're you're sometimes, you know, different business evolves into buy to let business. So I think if you can educate yourself and and know what's happening in in the industry, um, you know, look around at different lenders that are doing different things aside from your old style buy to let lenders, um, and I think your you, your own knowledge uh, will will bring clients to you um, on that basis. So it, it is tough to to build that client bank. It does take time, but. Um, you know, it's time hopefully you've got because I think, as you say, that the, the sector is going to continue to keep growing. 
Um, thank you very much for that. And I think we've only got time for one more. And it's back to EPCs. As EPC legislation hasn't come into force yet, is it a bit premature to recommend things? How do you strike that balance of preparation versus reality? John? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I made the point that said um, it's less about investing for the purposes of an EPC or, or for a date. It's, a, it's about maintaining the fabric of a property. Um, so I think having good, strong environmental advice um, and access to good data that, that allows you to assess what, what the, the state of a property is, um, understanding how it gets lived in and how it relates to the net, to the um, to your supply of energy, I think is very very important. Um, but fundamentally, it's about maintaining ma maintaining an asset that you want to appreciate, that you want to to see a, a premium um, in terms of its value, and you want to see a strong rental yield, and and all of those things. Um, you don't need to, you know, an EPC is just one very small part of a data set that enables you to appraise, appraise what the right thing to do at the right time is. Um, so yeah, the, that comment is correct in terms of um, EPCs and timing, but fundamentally maintaining the fabric of a property is a, is a very, very positive thing to be looking into and, and, and making sure you've got the data on to, to work through what, what matters. Um, having good advice is, again, good, a good part of that, both you know, from a financing perspective, but also from an environmental perspective. And um, hopefully, again, with the community, we'll be providing access to, to good sources of data, which can complement an EPC. And that seems like a very good note on which to end. So it, uh, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed this discussion and, uh, and can take away some practical ideas. I'd sum up very briefly to say the three ideas seem to be focused on the professional end of the buy-to-let market because that's where the growth is. It doesn't have to be that complicated. Sometimes it is. And if that's not where your strength is, you might want to work with a specialist referral partner, get closer to your landlord clients, open up conversations, find out what their motivations are. And finally, keep out an eye out for new initiatives, such as the Landlord Leaders Fund, um, energy upgrade products, and get involved in the Landlord Leaders community. Um, so, yeah, so buy, the buy to let sector is strong. It's evolving. So why not join in the journey? Um, right. Just remains for me to thank John Hall of OSB Group and Neil Chambers of Sirius Property Finance. Thanks to everyone who sent in a question. And thank you, everyone, for joining us and watching. Thanks again. And goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.